Hello again, everyone. This weekend, we celebrate Pentecost Sunday. It is the Sunday where we celebrate the sending of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. And I can't remember a time in my life where we need to be more desperate and prayerful for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. These are unprecedented times. We have been shut down for the most part for the past two and a half months. Uh, there is the, the past week's events in the city of Minneapolis uh, with all of the chaos and fear. There's just so much brokenness and anger and hurt. And even for me at, at a personal level, I cannot remember a time where I have seen more anxiety, uh, more hardship, more hurting people than, than in these past days. Even seeing lots of marriages and relationships that are on the brink, uh, these are just unprecedented uh, times in, in, my, in, in my lifetime and probably in, in your lifetime. And during these times, we really have to ask the question, what do we put our trust in? Do we put our trust in political solutions? Do we put our trust in the most powerful economy in the history of the world? Do we put our trust in modern science and modern medicine? Do we put our trust in reason, trying to talk to people reasonably about calming down and thinking through their actions? The more we put our trust in these things, the more I realize how these, these fail in the end. They, they don't last. They're not deep enough to change the hearts and minds of people. And it reminds me, we need to put our trust and God himself. Well, today we're going to read about the first Pentecost of the early church when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the early disciples. So we're going to read from Acts chapter 2, starting at verses 1 to 4, and then we'll kind of cover the rest of the chapter. Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then the disciples go out from this room filled with the Spirit. And it says that in Jerusalem, there were many gathered from all over the world and they began to hear the disciples speaking in each one of their own native languages. If you skip down to verse 9, it says there were Parthi uh, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and all the other parts of Libya uh, belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytites, Cretans and Arabians, what does this mean? They asked, but others mocked saying, they are filled with new wine. So you see this multicultural gathering of Jews from all over the world and other proselytes, others who had converted to Judaism, coming to gather to worship in Jerusalem from all over the known world. And the Holy Spirit begins to com communicate through the disciples to each one of these groups in a miraculous way. And then verses 14 to 41, we see Peter give his sermon. He tells the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ on this first Pentecost. And if you see in Peter, you see this new boldness that we've never seen in Peter before all throughout the gospels as he was afraid and denying Christ and acting cowardly. He is now confident proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to this multicultural gathering in Jerusalem. And then we skip down to verse 42 and we see a glimpse of the life of the early church. Verse 42 says this, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the word of God. Well, let's begin by talking about this. 
The biggest thing in the world is a spiritual battle. The biggest thing in the world is the spiritual battle that we are all a part of. All of our hearts, I think I'm sure this is true of you, but my heart has just been so heavy this week with all the riots and the racism and the virus and the lockdown and the politics and just so much brokenness, so much evil, and and it's overwhelming. And I, I really believe that, that this is the, pointing to the deeper spiritual war that is actually waging. And, and I think this is true of all of history. Like the deepest thing, the most important battle is not the external things. It is the battle of the soul. I think this is true of the early church as well as um, our day. We see all of the disruption in the world, but really the deepest thing that's going on is the battle of the, in the spiritual realm, a battle for souls. Notice what was going on in the, the passage. It says that there, all of these Jews had gathered from all over the world. They were coming to Jerusalem to worship. But why, why were they coming from all over the world? Well, the answer is that they, they had been scattered for, for centuries. Um, and the question was, had God failed his people? Because God promised them to give them a land forever. Had God failed? And the Jews were often persecuted and oppressed. Rome was fairly good to the Jews during these days, but eventually, not too many years after this, Rome came in and crushed Jerusalem and again, uh, destroyed the the temple. Um, See, the real battle is not all of these political and personal issues. The real battle that is being waged is the battle of the spirit. The biggest battle is a spiritual battle. Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 6. It's a great verse, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. It's a great verse for us in these times. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The real battle is a spiritual battle. What really ultimately matters is the deep things of the soul, the things that no person can see, the spirits that are waging war, in our very midst that we're unaware of. But, but it's easier to focus on practical solutions. It's, it's often easier to think about like political and economic solutions to the problems in which we face, but the problems are far, far deeper. G.K. Chesterton, one of my favorite authors, he, he kind of writes the irony about trying to like just solve everything economically. He says this, no man will die for practical politics, just as no man will die for play. Nero could not hire a hundred Christians to be eaten by lions at a shilling an hour, for men will not be martyred for money. You get the joke? He's like Nero, the, the persecutor of the church, couldn't pay Christians to go and die. They wouldn't die for money but they did go and die because of the spiritual battle, because of their faith. See, the deeper things are what ultimately matter. So what is the deeper things in in our lives? It's the things that often seem so insignificant. What were the disciples doing when Christ sent them back to Jerusalem? He didn't say, go and start a revolution. He didn't say, go and take over Jerusalem or take over Rome. He said, go and wait and pray. They waited and they prayed. See, I, I want to do something as if I can go and, and fix the problems of the world. But, but, but all of the spiritual battle begins when we get on our knees before the Lord. And my brothers and sisters, this is a time for us to be in prayer, to die to my desire to try to fix anything And if there is a God, and if we believe that that he is real, then we beg and plead for him to work. See, that's the battleground. That's the biggest thing that's happening in the world is the, the realm of the spirit. Peter Crave says this, prayer is a kind of death, a rehearsal for death. In praying, we die to ourselves, our wills, our ordinary consciousnesses, and desires and concerns, even our ordinary world, and enter into God's world, aligning our minds and wills with God's. We die to our time and sacrifice our loaves and fishes to him, and he multiplies them.
See, when we take prayer seriously, and I mean prayer and fasting, and come before the Lord, this is where the battle begins. Well, secondly, secondly from this passage, we notice that the biggest thing in the world didn't make the news. The biggest thing in, in, in the world that was happening on the first Pentecost didn't make the Roman newspapers, if there was such a thing, or whatever the equivalent was, right? Roman didn't, Rome didn't notice any of this. There were many, many more quote-unquote major world events taking place on that Pentecost Sunday where the Holy Spirit was poured out and the Christian movement began. But over the course of a few short centuries, this little band of nobodies in Jerusalem had created a movement, the movement of Jesus Christ, that overturned the world's greatest empire. See, I, I think during these times, it is easy to be disheartened. What does the future hold? Is society falling apart with all of the fear and anger? And, and I'll be honest with you, I'm always very slow to predict future events. But these are troublesome times. And I think it's easy for me to want to like start to predict that like, just because it seems like everything is, is coming apart, everything is crumbling. But, but there is a reminder that you and I, we only see this much of what's actually happening. See, the real battle is going on at a spiritual level. And then the things that are deepest and most important, we don't see. I think it's easy for those of us in the West to think that everything is coming apart, that everything is crumbling. But we only see this much. This, this statistic comes from about 10 years ago, but it, but it always reminds me of how little my perspective it is. During the 20th century, 4,300 people left the church every day in Europe and North America. We have seen over the last hundred years, a drastic drop in, in the Christian church in what used to be Christendom, the West. 4,300 people a day. And that's one of the reasons I think as Christians we feel like everything's coming apart. At the same time, what we don't recognize is during that same period of time, it's estimated that 16,500 people come to the church every day in Africa. And about that same number grow into the church in China. It is estimated that between 1970 and 1985, just during that 15-year period of time, 6 million people came to Christ in Africa. See, we only see this much of what God is doing. And the New Testament church, if you think about the New Testament church, this small group of people where the Holy Spirit was poured out upon they, they, they trusted in Christ. They knew he was alive. And yet they faced great persecution. And compared to the Roman Empire, they were nothing by worldly standards. You think about Paul. Paul, who began to travel and speak the gospel all throughout, um, all throughout the Mediterranean. He was imprisoned time and time again and persecuted. And the Roman Empire of the first persecution was a guy by the name of Nero. We already talked about him earlier. He was the first Roman Caesar who really began to persecute the church. And at the time, it just it, like it's not even comparable what was actually happening. All the power was with Rome. And Dennis Kinlaw, he writes this. He said, Paul was beaten. He was thrown into prison. Nero was the leader of the world's largest empire. It sure looks like Nero is going to win and Paul is going to lose. And then Kinlaw says this. He says, but now you'll name your dog Nero and you'll name your son Paul. Why? Man, at the time, it looked like this little band of Christians could do nothing. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, God transformed the entire world. See, the biggest thing in the world often doesn't make the headlines. Lastly, the biggest thing in the world happened in homes. All of us want the perfect society, don't we? 
And, and I think over the last several hundred years, there's been this push to create a utopian society, a place where everyone will be treated equally, a place where everyone will share all of their possessions. You hear it in you know, John Lennon's famous song, imagine no possessions, I wonder if you can, no need for greed, no hunger, a brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You may say I'm a dreamer. Um, yeah, that's actually John Lennon. That's exactly what I think you are. I think you're a dreamer because I, I don't think it's possible. Why? It sounds great, but, but all of these utopian ideas of society, they forget one key point, and it's this. They forget about the heart of human beings. Have you met any human beings? Because um, human beings are amazing and beautiful and intelligent and horrible and liars and selfish and conniving scoundrels. Like, talk to some people. Really get to know them. And then any time you think of building a perfect utopia... With such broken and sinful persons. Well, the utopian dreams start to fall apart pretty quickly. Now, I'm not a construction worker, so take this analogy with a grain of salt, but I assume that a construction worker couldn't take a bunch of rotten lumber and turn it into a beautiful and solid home. In the same way, you can't take a bunch of sinful and broken selfish and vile human beings and turn them into a perfect, well-oiled society. It just doesn't happen. And if the 20th century has taught us anything, it is that utopian societies often leave behind tens of millions of citizens dead. But then you have this picture of the early church. Did you notice it? It says that everybody came together in unity. They, they, there were people selling their property and, and distributing it, sharing it. That none had need. They, they shared and took care of each other. They were breaking bread together daily. How is that possible? It sounds like the, this kind of perfect community that everybody seems to want to build, but nobody is able to because of the brokenness of humanity. So the question is, how did the early church do this? We get the evidence in verses 42 and 43. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. How were they unified together? They had the common belief. The apostles' teaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the work of the Spirit in their midst, unifying them together in the name of Jesus Christ. And the biggest thing in the world that was happening was happening in the homes of individuals. See, the early church started in homes, these small things. They didn't have public worship places to gather uh, and, and they ministered in conversation around their tables together. And they began to grow and grow and multiply and spread from city to city. This movement of the spirit that would eventually take over the whole Roman Empire. See, we, we, can't, we can't reproduce this through our own actions. It was a work of the spirit in the lives of the first Christians and what a hopeful word for us today. See, the true community that the world so desperately desires, this community where people love and share and grow together, it's already been established in the body of Christ, true repentant believers in Jesus Christ who are being transformed by the Holy Spirit, who really do love, who can really sacrifice for one another. It's already here. What is the hope of the world? The hope of the world is Jesus Christ. And it's the Holy Spirit in us, filling us. The hope of the world is, is simple and beautiful things as, the, as, as God transforms us from the inside out. The simple, beautiful, spirit-filled, humble lives 
of God's people. It is faithfulness and prayer. It is our obedience to the one true God, even if the whole world around us is falling apart. That is where our hope lies. And that's God's style. Think about that. A humble laborer from a small town in the middle of nowhere is where God showed up. With no fanfare, no headlines, a humble carpenter. That man changed the world. That, that man redeemed all of humanity. And he is still drawing people to himself, building his kingdom. He's our Lord, he's our King, and it's in him that we trust. God bless you.